Chinabe Nene and Dao, uh, Nagojima Nang, uh, sorry, uh, Pamadesh Gona Young, and uh, Donjiba, Minwa Nagoja Nang Dada. So uh, I introduced myself, I said, uh, Anin Bojo, so that's a formal and an informal greeting. I mentioned to you uh, a name that I hold in the Anishinaabe One language, uh, Wazze Winga Shnin, and it discusses that, uh, sort of describes that relationship of sweetgrass as a medicine and being an individual with knowledge around the sweetgrass and to be offered that as medicine. Uh, as well, I, I acknowledge that I'm a Mississauga Anishinaabe Nene, uh, so I'm a Mississauga Anishinaabe man, and Anishinaabe loosely meaning the people, or a, a human being, rather, a two-legged being. There's no color, gender, race, or anything ascribed to that. It basically describes us being beings, uh, hence lowered or hence created. Uh, when I say Mississauga or Mississauga or Mississauga, it talks about those individuals or those people who reside or settle on or upon mouths of or mouths of rivers and bodies of water. And so if you look at uh, traditional Michisagi communities, you'll notice right there is water, okay? Uh, and I talked about, I said, Pamadesh uh, Kodeyang Ndonjiba. So that's where I'm from. I'm from sort of the, the communities around the Lake of Burning Plains or Lake of Burning Grass. I'm from Hiawatha First Nation, a member of Hiawatha First Nation, as well as family from Alderville First Nation. And if you notice, Hiawatha is situated on the North Shore of Rice Lake and Alderville First Nation is situated on the South Shore of Rice Lake. And I'll get a little bit more into that after when we look at some maps. Okay, and I said, uh, so Nagojwanong being that place at the foot of the rapids or the city of Peterborough and in Dada, that's where I'm currently residing right now. Okay, and so I'm residing right here in the heart of Michisagi territory and I want to acknowledge that as a strong Michisagi Nishinaabe Nene. Okay, and so I'm going to present now, let's see. Goodness, sorry guys. Sorry guys, I have to go. Oh my goodness. I do apologize, guys. I'm new to the Google Meet uh, environment here. So, can everybody see that okay? Maybe if somebody could verbally just tell me if they can see it okay, that would be great. You're good to go, Ryan. Perfect. All right. So, this is going to be a, a presentation on Peterborough and Area Treaties, or what I like to call Michisaugi Treaties, because um, there are no other signatories to treaties in the Peterborough area other than Michisaugi people. Okay. And I do want to stress that uh, Michisaugi people, this is a traditional territory. We've been here for thousands and thousands of years if we go back to sort of our migratory story from the East Coast. Okay. And so, I'm talking about maps. Here's sort of a loose territorial map for traditional Michisaugi Nishabe territory. And so, you see that sort of dark blue right there down near Lake Ontario to the right hand side. So that is what we refer to as traditional Michisaugi territory. Now I want to preface that these are loose borders, okay? And then you'll see that sort of darker green to the top right there. We call that Algonquin territory or, or Omama Wanene Anishinaabe people, okay? Now those borders are loose, okay? We didn't have a, a map that was just, or sorry, divvied up like a pie, okay, as you see current maps today, those borders are very loose, and, and it speaks to the close relationship that not only within the Michisagi people, or sorry, Miss, or uh, Anishinaabe people, but even with other, like the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, these borders flip-flop, they changed over time, they're not hard lines in the sand, okay? 
And so these territories you see on this map, they might differ from other maps that you'll see. Okay, and I want to speak that to multiple truth. There is not one overall map that is 100% correct. There is rather a multitude of maps that speak similar truths. Okay, and so you see to the north of that we have what we would consider Nip Nipissing Anishinaabe people. You've got the Odawa Anishinaabe people. You've got the what we consider Chippewa or Ojibwa or Ojibwe. Uh, you've got the Soto, Ojikri, Botawatomi, or Potawatomi. Now, these are all part of what we call a, a nation of back people that speak a similar di or sorry, a similar language with different dialects and different relationships to their geographic locations on the map. Okay. And so, what is a treaty? Is there anybody who could sort of give me a, a quick uh, a quick answer about what a treaty is? I can. Sure. Why don't you go ahead and give me a quick one minute rundown? Like a treaty, like, can I, would a treaty of Versailles count? Yeah, that is still a treaty, certainly, if you wanted to use that context. In that, what would a treaty be? Uh, just like, like a promise of something, like of land and stuff. Yeah, like a promise, an agreement, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, a promise, an agreement, for sure. You're right in the, you're right in step there. So definition of a treaty, an agreement or arrangement made by negotiation or a contract in writing between two or more political authorities, such as states or sovereigns, formally signed by representatives duly authorized and usually ratified by the lawmaking authority of the state. And so when we're talking about two or more political authorities, in the context of treaties in Canada, we're saying political authorities as one being Indigenous, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Algonquin, Cree, okay, so those would be potential political authorities on one side, and then on the other side we call them the Crown Authorities, or what we're going to talk about is the Queen or King of England or the United Kingdom, we're going to look at Canada, we're going to look at the province, we're going to look at municipalities as political authorities to enter into these agreements, okay, and they're usually formally signed by representatives duly authorized, and those individuals would either be appointed by the Crown or the Crown representatives, okay, and then as well representatives duly authorized duly authorized would be leadership within an indigenous context whether those are are chieftains or individuals seen as being leaders in a community to stand in that place and negotiate and make agreements okay and that could be men and women okay or how we know men and women today they could be either or okay <clears throat> And so one of the important things that i want to start off with is something called the royal proclamation which was signed and delivered in 1763 by King George III of England. And so as we know, at this time, North America was known as what they called the New World, okay? It was seen as a dominion of England, or sorry, became the dominion of Canada, but it was a, a colony of England at that time, okay? And so the Royal Proclamation is a document that set out guidelines for European settlement of Aboriginal territories in what is now North America, inclusive of Canada and the United States as we know it now. At that time, it was simply known as North America, the New World, okay, or largely in an Indigenous context, Turtle Island, right, our home. The Royal Proclamation was initially issued by King George III in 1763 to officially claim British territory in North America after Britain won the Seven Years' War. And I hope that you guys have had a discussion around the Seven Years' War, or at least been introduced to the Seven Years' War, where Britain had pushed France out of the colonies, okay? And now they were sort of the reigning authority in, over, this, over this new British territory in North America, okay? As well, the Royal Proclamation explicitly states that Aboriginal title has existed and continues to exist, and that all land would be considered Aboriginal land until ceded by treaty. The proclamation forbade settlers from claiming land from the Aboriginal occupants unless it has been first bought by the Crown and then sold to the settlers. The Royal Proclamation further sets out that only the Crown can buy land from First Nations. Most Indigenous and legal scholars recognize the Royal Proclamation as an important first step toward the recognition of existing Aboriginal rights and title, including the right to self-determination. So in this regard, the Royal Proclamation is sometimes called the Indian Magna Carta. Now I understand that there is really a lot of information embedded in these statements here, and it can be what we call very convoluted or very uh, complex. It's really not, okay? And so what they're saying here is most Indigenous and most legal scholars, so we're looking at lawyers and judges, whether they be Indigenous or non-Indigenous, with both claims to Indigenous sovereignty as well as to uphold 
Canada's rights over Canadian, what they consider Canadian territory. Okay. And so they look at this Royal proclamation as being a foundation to look at. Peace. Okay. Sorry, Ryan. Yeah, I was just trying to turn off. That was Emily's that I think was on. No, that's okay. I uh, patience is a, is a virtue, right? That's okay. Uh, mistakes happen. I run into problems screen sharing and presenting virtually all the time. So no problem at all, and and no issues. Okay. And so here's a few key treaties that I want to discuss today with you guys, okay? And first is what we call the Crawford's Purchase or Purchases, okay? And then we move on to the Johnson Butler Purchases or one that is referred to as what we call the Gunshot Treaty. And I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that, okay? We have the Rice Lake Purchase or Treaty Number 20. And then finally, we're going to end off with the Williams Treaties. And then I'm going to go into a discussion around what we call the Alderville litigation. Or for what some of you know, there was a settlement a few years ago pertaining to the Williams Treaties, and that's what that's referencing, okay? And so behind this, you see a map of Southern Ontario, well, it's Ontario Treaties, but right here looking specifically at Southern Ontario pre-Confederation or pre-Canada treaties, which are signed directly with Indigenous nations or First Nations and the King and Queen of the, uh, of the British Empire, okay? So starting in 1783 with Crawford's purchases. And so in the map to the left-hand side, you see there's this light yellow and then this light purple. And both of those are part of what we call the Crawford's Purchases Treaties in 1783. And they were signed between Michisaugee peoples in the Bay of Quinte. Okay, and this is where it gets really interesting. So when I said I was from Alderville First Nation, does anybody here know where Alderville First Nation is located? It's just a little bit north of Coburg on the south shore of Rice Lake. If you head up, uh, I think it's County Road 45, it's right there, okay? And uh, it actually, that's not the original place that that community was situated. Actually, that community was situated in the Bay of Quinney, not far from present day Belleville. Okay. And those are the original signatories to the land cessions or treaties in that territory. Not to say that the Mohawks are not signatories to treaties and land cessions in that area. Rather, they received land grants as what we call United Empire loyalists or sympathizers to the British crown during the American Revolution. Okay, and so when they were pushed out of the United States as sympathizers to the British crown, they needed land to go to, they needed land to settle. And so the Mohawks being uh, ally having alliances with the British Empire during that time, they were pushed north and so they had to find land for them. So they enveloped land along the north shore of Lake Ontario for settlement of United Empire loyalists and Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte being a group of those people. And so that's how you find them near Belleville in the Bay of Quinte in their community today. And that is exactly why you find the community of Six Nations where it is today in that Brant Tract, okay, or the Haldeman Tract, they call it. But yes, in 1783, Representative uh, Crawford purchased or ceded land from Michisaugee people in 1783 and then therefore given back to Mohawks Bay Quinney in 1793, okay? And then we move into the Johnson Butler purchases in 1787 and 1788 and it's sometimes called the Gunshot Treaty, okay? It was entered into in 1788 by representatives of the Crown and certain Michisaugee Anishinaabe peoples. The treaty covers the North Shore of Lake Ontario beginning at the eastern boundary of the Toronto Purchase and continuing east to the Bay of Quinte where it meets the Crawford purchases. Okay, and that includes present day Durham, Port Hope, Coburg. Um, what else are some of those little towns along the 401 corridor there? Um, right until you hit about Carrying Place, okay? Now this treaty was sometimes referred to as the Gunshot Treaty because it covered the land as far back from the lake as a person could hear a gunshot. And these lands were the subject of a confirmatory surrender in the Williams Treaties of 1923. And like I said, current communities in the area include Oshawa and Coburg, Newcastle, Bowmanville, right? Um, a lot of really key towns and cities that we know of today. And so when we say as far back from the lake as a person could hear a gunshot, in these treaties, well, actually they found that there really weren't any parameters associated with this treaty. Rather, it loosely talks about a, a territory in which you could hear a gunshot. Well, I want to know how far can you hear a gunshot? Did they have individuals standing at the place where they saw or talked to the treaty, which is now what we call Port Hope? Okay. 
all now were there individuals sitting up on Rice Lake, were there individuals sitting in Caring Place, and were there individuals sitting along Lake Ontario to hear this said gunshot? We're not sure, and that is why it was it was scrutinized and subject to what we call a confirmatory surrender in the Williams Treaties. I'll talk a little bit more about that because it's a very specific clause in the Williams Treaty that they talk about. And then that moves us into today. So it's called the Rice Lake Purchase. And so when I'm saying I'm sitting in Nugojuanong or Peterborough or that place at the foot of the rapids, you can see it right there in the middle of the map, Peterborough. Okay. And so this highlighted sort of brownish yellow section, those are the parameters of the Rice Lake Purchaser Treaty 20, which was signed again in uh, present day Port Hope. Okay. Or I think it was called uh, Fort Hope at the time. Okay. <clears throat> And so these parameters set out present day Peterborough County. So if you look in sort of the top right corner, if anybody's ever been to Apsley, Ontario, all right, there's North Quartha Township, but Apsley, Ontario is sort of in that top right corner. And then you go over way to the top left corner, you've got Aurelia, and you come down sort of to the bottom left corner, you've got Port, present day Port Perry, and then you follow that right across almost to, to the bottom right, you've got Havelock, Campbellford area, okay? And then it leaks into what we call uh, uh, present day Northumberland County. Okay, and so treaty number 20 of the Rice Lake Purchase was signed in November 5th of 1818 at Smith's Creek, sorry, in the township of Hope, or today the city of Port Hope. And it ceded just roughly or just south of 2 million acres to the Crown to allow for colonization of present day Peterborough city and county. Now, we do know prior to 1818, there was already settlement of what we call present day settlers in this area, but the land hadn't been ceded, what we call it was unceded aboriginal territory what that means it is actually formally not a part of the colon the colonies of britain nor would it have been today part of present day canada and i'll talk a little bit more about that near the end and what we're talking about ceded and unceded territory and it has it really has a lot of relevance in today's discussions around aboriginal title and and exercisement of aboriginal rights and freedoms okay and so the purchase price was set at 749 um, British pounds in goods at the Montreal price to be delivered yearly. As well, there was, it was further broken down to explain that the yearly payment was to be $10 in goods at the Montreal price to every man, woman, and child alive at the time of the signing. And later on, it was amended to reflect and said that the payments would cease upon death. So it was only one generation of people that would take advantage of the yearly payment or um, sorry, we call um, annuity payment. Okay. And they had amended that treaty to cease the annuity payments upon death of that generation of people, which is a very intriguing and interesting because when we look at the numbered treaties, um, you know, there are yearly annuities for lifetime. They're very small, but those people that are signatories to those treaties exercise their right to collect that annuity every year. And, and that's sort of a, an acknowledgement, and a respect of that agreement in that treaty, okay? And so I do wanna add, when we start talking about the Williams treaties, that during the Rice Lake purchase of the negotiations for Treaty 20, there is evidence to indicate in the meeting minutes that there were agreements made between the parties, so the Crown, as well as Mississauga and Anishinaabe people, to uphold, recognize, and exercise harvesting and gathering rights within the negotiated territory. Okay, and so when we look at negotiated territory, we're talking specifically about this brown area right here, yellow area right here. Okay, so although they had signed a treaty, ceded territory, and ultimately extinguished what we call Aboriginal title over this territory, it was verbally agreed upon in these meetings and negotiations that to recognize, uphold, and exercise harvesting and gathering rights within that negotiated territory, although title was being signed away. And this also paved the way for negotiating First Nations, which at the, at the time would have been Michisagi people of now Curve Lake, of now Peterborough, and of now Scugog Island First Nation, right? That they actually had some discretion over where they would like their, ter their communities, present day reserves, situated. And you notice Curve Lake is on a peninsula on uh, now Shamong Lake, but back in the day, Mud Lake, okay? You look at Hiawatha First Nation situated right on the shore of Rice Lake and on the mouth of the Otonomy River, Oday Nabe River. And then you look at Scugog Island First Nation, again, an island, but again, a little peninsula jutting into uh, Lake Scugog. So again, on or about 
water and mouths of rivers. Very interesting, right? And they actually had discretion over choosing those territories, which is contrary to some belief that all reserves were arbitrarily set up. Not necessarily. There were some negotiations where communities actually got some discretion over where they wanted their communities situated. Now, the size of the communities and later on, uh, later on uh, seizures of land would definitely impact the size of our communities today. But back then, there was some discretion and some respect over where these individuals wanted to set up their communities, where they wanted to live, okay? As well as an agreement that although they were situated in a reserve or in a small community, they could still exercise their rights within the entirety of Peterborough County and city, okay? And so <clears throat> that moves us into today, the 1923, the Williams Treaties, okay? And so in these blue here, is the land that is specifically discussed and ceded and signed for in the Williams Treaties and compensated for, okay? And so there's seven, seven signatory First Nations, and I'll get to those after, but Clause 1, okay? Clause 1, there's three clauses of the Williams Treaty or three parts, okay? But clause 1 is this large territory in the north part, this first square in the top that you see Algonquin Park. I hope everybody here has seen Algonquin Park at some point in their life, but there it is, right there in the, in the middle, okay? Uh, clause 2 refers to the southern section, thought previously to be ceded as per the Gunshot Treaty. But during the research phase of the Williams Treaty preparation, they found that there were no parameters discussed, nor there were no physical documents signed describing the territory that is the Gunshot Treaty or the Johnson Butler Purchase. So they had to add that into as a second clause. Again, a confirmatory surrender. And then there is this what we call the pesky basket clause in some of our, our territories, some of our communities, but the basket clause. Now, there was some ambiguity as to whether this clause was written into the treaty upon signing or post signing. And again, that was scrutinized during the Alderville litigation. But it was thought to extinguish any and all harvesting and gathering rights within pre Confederation treaty territory. So, if you look to the south of the big square, you can kind of see a loose outline on the, on the left and on the bottom of Treaty 20. So they're saying that in the basket clause, this actually signed away any and all rights and privileges associated with pre-Confederation treaty negotiations, which was not true. Uh, and any claims before or after this agreement are what we considered null and void. They won't even be discussed. Okay. So... The Williams Treaties of 1923, and so when I say there's seven signatory First Nations, that includes the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, Curve Lake First Nation, Alderville First Nation, and Hiawatha First Nation. And at the time of this signing and negotiations, they considered the Scugog Island, or prior, sorry, to 1923, the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation are referred to as the Balsam Lake Mississauga, or Balsam Lake Nishinaabe, the Curve Lake were the Mud Lake Nishinaabe, Alderville was Alderville First Nation, but prior to that, they were the Michisaugeek or Anishinaabe of the Bay of Quinte or Grape Island, and then Hiawatha First Nation, or um, so they called it the, the Rice Lake Band or, or Rice Lake Nishinaabe. And then we have the Chippewas Rama First Nation, Beausoleil First Nation, and Georgina Island First Nation as the other three signatories. And the traditional territories of these respective communities includes the Georgian Bay and Lake Ontario watersheds, as well as several principal tributaries and streams. So rivers, streams, ponds. Um, there's a, a, a community leader and knowledge holder out of Alderville First Nation, Dave Mowat, that talks about these principal tributaries and streams that um, are considered highways, county roads, and uh, and back roads throughout Anishinaabe territory. Because as we know, prior to colonization and expansion of the territories, there were no roads, there were no highways, there were there was no 401, 400, 407, Highway 20, none of those, right? So how did they get around? They certainly got around by land. But as you know, for anybody who walks to school, sometimes it can take you a long time to walk to school and sometimes take you a short time. They didn't have bicycles yet. So what were they doing? They were riding the rivers, the streams, and the ponds, and the lakes to get around, okay? And so now you see Hiawatha, Curved Lake, Alderville First Nation, very small communities. Now, all the resources could not be gathered within a small community. So they used these principal tributaries and streams to go throughout their vast territory to bring in their resources for subsistence, income, and to take care of their families and communities, okay? And so I want to preface and say the Williams Treaties are, were a direct response to what we consider unceded Indigenous or Aboriginal territory that were unceded from prior agreements and treaties. Okay, so it's dealing with land. In 1923, the Williams Treaties are dealing with land 
in a large portion of Ontario that actually legally is not recognized as being a part of Canada. It is a, a sovereign territory. It is not a part of Canada. It is not legislated under Canada, nor is it un legislated under the province of Ontario until the signing of the 1923 Williams Treaties. And so post-1818, and I'm going to talk about why, why did they negotiate the Williams Treaties? Why is this a thing? Why did it even, why did it even develop? Okay. And so post-1818 or the signing of the Rice Lake Purchase, okay, there were several claims brought to the provincial and federal governments over the next century by the First Nations that there were white squatters encroaching on their traditional hunting grounds that were supposed to be protected by said governments. Because again, Aboriginal title is still being held over these large swaths of Ontario land that aren't ceded yet. And so as we know from the Royal Proclamation and King George III said that they don't have any powers over these lands. Individuals cannot negotiate these lands. The lands must be negotiated through the crown and then sold to settlers or given back to First Nations people. Okay. And so there were many confrontations, mostly violent, that often left the Indigenous individuals facing repercussions for their actions. So when I say confrontations and mostly violent, it was a lot of hunting, fishing and gathering groups that would uh, have skirmishes or confrontations, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous on the other side. And in most cases, uh, as we look into topics of, of race and the socio-political environment of the time, most often those individuals of color or those individuals that were visibly indigenous or, rec or acknowledged that they were indigenous often faced harsher repercussions for their actions than non-indigenous individuals did. Um, you know, and unfortunately, we have to remedy these situations today. And uh, we look to you guys, the youth, to be more educated so that these types of things don't happen again. Okay. And so for about 100 years, it wasn't until the early 1920s, communities attempted to retain legal representation to review and carry their claims forward yet again to the government. Okay. So for 100 years, these communities and these groups of Indigenous or Michisagi people were pushing forth claims to the provincial and federal government saying that, Settlers are encroaching on our territory. It is not ceded. There is no treaty. They have no right to the resources and the settlement of those lands. It is hence, therefore, still ours. But the provincial and federal governments weren't hearing that. They weren't acknowledging these claims, nor were they making any attempt to resolve these claims. And so for 100 years, it wasn't until these bands or these communities uh, tried to hire legal representation or lawyers, okay? And so at that time, banned funds were not to be used for that purpose. If so, they would have been withheld by the Crown. And so when I say uh, we're not to be used for that purpose, it was illegal, okay? It was illegal under the Indian Act for uh, First Nations people to hire legal representation to carry claims forward, okay? And so if they were to use banned funds to hire these lawyers, when we say they would be withheld by the Crown, those banned funds were not necessarily sent specifically for legal representation. It was sent forth to, to administer and organize and, and help our communities function. So if they hold back that money, how do we pay for health care? How do we pay for social services? How do we pay for education? How do we pay for other resources and infrastructure in our communities? So again, you see it's a whole can of worms. And so in 1922, leadership of Christian Island First Nation took up a collection to fund a retainer fee for a lawyer. This lawyer was informed by the Department of Justice at the time that his services were not needed as a solicitor, has been appointed to their claim. So the government of Canada is saying that to this particular lawyer who was potentially being retained by Christian Island First Nation, that they were no longer needed and that the Crown took the duty to assign a solicitor to this particular claim to represent this First Nation. So it seems very illegitimate. Uh, this lawyer, A.G. Chisholm, had warned the Indian Affairs that the band had a natural right to choose their own counsel, especially dealing with lands that they still had Aboriginal title over. So you see it becomes a legal and, and judicial issue there. Also, if the claim was to conclude in an unfortunate manner, the band would inevitably blame the department. OK, and when I say that, it's especially because the again, the Department of Indian Affairs and the Department of Justice had assigned or supposedly assigned a solicitor to their case on their behalf. So if, if the claim didn't go the way that this First Nation wanted it to go, they would for sure have blamed Indian Affairs and the Department of Justice for, uh, I want to say, a lackluster legal representation. 
Okay. And so on many occasions, the Chippewa Mississauga bands had submitted requests to the Crown for maps regarding their protected hunting grounds within the unceded Northern territories, and also maps of Indian surrenders that directly affected their respective bands. Okay. So they wanted to see visual and physical evidence of their unceded territories, territories that have been ceded, and territories with their harvesting and gathering rights protected and entrenched. Each time they were given a response that no such maps or documents existed. So prior to the 1923 Williams treaties, the Mississaugas and Chippewas had Aboriginal title to the north of prior treaties as this land had not yet been included in any prior treaty. All right, we go back to the map. We see again, this large swath of land right here in the north. So it extends what we call the 45th parallel or just north of Apsley right there in the middle, okay? It juts far to the west, almost right into the Ottawa Valley, north, right along, uh, I think that's the James Bay. And then uh, again, north up into North Bay and then left here to Georgian Bay and all along there's Perry Sound in the middle, right? Right down into Ram on Aurelia. That's a huge pocket of Ontario that essentially is not Ontario. It is not Canada at this present moment until they sign the treaty. And so again, in 1923, a violent confrontation occurred between white and First Nations trappers up in this Northern Territory. And this sparked the beginnings of the Williams Treaty Commission. And so when I say a violent confrontation, there were shots fired, there were individuals injured. And so at this time, the Crown said, no, this is something we need to look into because there's the potential for loss of life and, you know, what we call civil conflict or, you know, in some rights, domestic terrorism in today's sense. Okay. And so they investigated approximately 10,000 square miles or over 27,000 square kilometers that extended from the 45th parallel to north of Lake Nipissing in North Bay and from Georgia Bay east to the Ottawa River. And so once the investigation concluded, the report submitted, it, it took less than 22 days to sign the treaties. So when I say 22 days to sign the treaties, that's 22 days of council and negotiation and signing of the treaties, which is a very short window for such a vast, vast territory, okay? And so again, you have to ask, are these treaties being negotiated in what we refer to as good faith? And it's not until the uh, Alderville litigation that they get into saying that no, these treaties were not negotiated in good faith and were not properly compensated for the territory that they held title over, okay? And so here we get into some particular facts about the signing of the Williams treaties, okay? And so there's, the Williams treaties discuss the same territories, the same parameters and the same wording on each document, but there's two separate documents. Okay. And one is the Chippewa treaty signed on October 31st in 1923 and the signatories to that are Rama, Georgina and Beausoleil and Mississauga treaty signed on November 15th, 1923, which includes Aldeville, Curve Lake, Hiawatha and Scugog Island First Nations. Now the treaties are completely identical other than the reference to the Chippewa bands, and the Mississauga bands. And how they came about that was a discussion around the historical relationship that individuals have to territory, how they refer to their own communities and nations of people in the larger context of being an Anishinaabe person, a human speaking Anishinaabe one language or Algonquin, uh, Algonquin family of languages, okay? And so during the investigation, not only did they find this large Northern Territory had not been ceded under any prior treaty and there was still title held, it wasn't until they started to do the research into the Southern Territory and realizing that there's that arm referred to as the Gunshot Treaty of the Johnson Butler Purchase in 1788, that there weren't any parameters associated in a written treaty anywhere filed with the Department of Indian Affairs. So they had to add in that Southern arm or that clause too to ensure that it was a confirmatory surrender and that it was truly surrendered right there in 1923 because there was no evidence to indicate it that it was confirmed and surrendered back in 1788. Rather, it was a discussion and there were journal entries and there were meeting minutes described, but there were no parameters signed on a physical document, okay? And so the result of repeated reports of encroachment of settlers into unceded Anishinaabe territory and many confrontations resulting in violence. So the William Shrees are a direct result of repeated reports of encroachment and violent confrontations. And so we don't really see Treaty 20 in 1818 and the Williams Treaties and the parameters of those treaties be scrutinized until 
the uh, late 70s and early 80s in a, in a landmark uh, provincial uh, Supreme Court ruling in the R versus Taylor and Williams. And if there's anybody in the room who's familiar with uh, Doug Williams or Elder Doug Williams from Curve Lake First Nation, I works at Trent University. When they talk about that Williams in that case, that's the Elder Doug Williams. And so the, in the late 70s, uh, they were uh, caught, charged, and I believe, yes, caught, charged, and convicted of uh, harvesting and gathering bullfrogs out of season. Okay, so they were uh, potentially, uh, how do you call that? Um, disregarding, um, Jesus, I can't come up with the words, sorry. Um, they were breaking laws by taking these bullfrogs out of season. Now that's, you know, as per the game laws, but as Taylor and Williams argue in their court case, they rely on their history and what they've been told about their treaties and the rights that are protected in that 1818 treaty and saying that no, they have a right to fish, hunt, gather out of season, outside of their First Nation territory, outside of their reserve territory in the territory that is discussed in that Treaty 20 or Peterborough County. And so they took it to the Ontario Court of Appeal in which they overturned their convictions and that the Ontario Court of Appeal had found that harvesting rights were found to be protected by the 1818 treaty. Okay, and so from 1981 until 1994, the province of Ontario acknowledged and recognized that no, your harvesting and gathering rights within Treaty 20 territory are recognized and that the Williams treaties do not sign away or give away those rights to subsistence gathering and harvesting. Okay, now it wasn't until the late 80s until an individual by the name of George Howard Sr. Uh, was caught fishing or gathering walleye outside of season on the Otonomy River, which is just adjacent to Hiawatha First Nation, okay? And so, again, he was charged, he was convicted, it was taken to the Ontario Court of Appeals, they upheld that conviction, and so Howard took it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, okay? in his hopes that his convictions would be overturned and these rights would be acknowledged, respected, and encroached in the Constitution, saying that no, they were agreed upon back in 1818. And so based upon what they refer to as expert testimony from the community, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that rights were extinguished as per the Basque Clause in the 1923 treaties, okay? And it wasn't until this R versus Howard case where the scrutiny of this said Basket Clause was even really discussed. So there's serious questions around did the First Nations communities have informed, dis, informed, in, or sorry, were they informed that the Basket Clause existed? Was the Basket Clause in the treaty prior to signing or post signing? And that is one of the arguments the Aldeville litigation really hinged on. Okay. Uh, and, and I want to add, you know, and, and it's sort of a, a dark chapter, I want to say, in, uh, you know, Williams Treaty's history. But when I talk about that expert testimony, it was actually Hiawatha First Nation community members that talked and said that, no, the, the individuals who signed those treaties in 1923 were well-educated businessmen and they knew full well that the basket clause was included and they knew full well that they were signing away their subsistence rights to harvesting and gathering. Um, and that's and that's a high wealth of First Nation community member. And so that's, I want to say it's kind of a, a dark chapter in high wealth is history and that a community member would go against what I would call, you know, indigenous collective rights and responsibilities and to agree with a crown representative or, or the Supreme Court of Canada and saying that no, they knew that their rights were extinguished and that they continued to violate those rights full well knowing it was illegal when in reality, it certainly was not illegal. Okay. And so that brings us to the Aldeville litigation. So at about on or about the conclusion of the R versus Howard uh, appeal before the Supreme Court, it was known that the appeal was not going to go their way. So uh, it started with the Aldeville First Nation filed a lawsuit in the province of Ontario and then was later in 1992, the other six William Treaties First Nations signed on. And then they put forth their claims, took it to the Supreme Court of Canada and this this litigation, or sorry, this case didn't go before the Supreme Court of Canada until 2012, okay? So that's a 20-year history in the courts of challenges, of negotiations, of collecting evidence, okay? And so that's why I want to see these land claims. You know, you hear about these land claims being settled today. Today, the individuals reaping the benefits of these, of these winning these claims and battles, it's the generation before them that took it upon themselves to say, no, this is wrong. This is not right. And if we want to protect our rights, our privileges, our freedoms, and our responsibilities for the generations to come, 
we have to go and we have to fight at the highest courts to ensure that our rights, our freedoms, our identities are protected. So that today, you know, youth such as yourselves get to learn about these and get to reap the benefits of being, a, you know, uh, an inherent, uh, what do I want? To, an inherent treaty rights holder, because everybody here in this meeting today is 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 uh, holds treaty rights, whether that be to subsistence as harvesting or whether that be to, you know holding space, residing, and living your life here in Canada, in Ontario, in Peterborough County, in Peterborough City. Um, you know, reaping the benefits of that is directly linked to the signing of these treaties and these negotiations and that we can all exist here, coexist here in a harmonious and friendly way. And that's the goal, okay? And so on October 29th in 2012, uh, in Alderville Indian Band et al., versus Her Majesty the Queen et al, Canada and uh, so Canada and Ontario took the position at trial that harvesting rights associated with pre-confederation treaties signed by the Williams Treaty's First Nations were not intended to be surrendered in 1923, particularly in the Treaty 20 area, which was the subject of judicial scrutiny in Taylor and Williams and Yar versus Howard cases, okay? And so before I move on, I wanna say the key takeaway from what I'm talking about today is there is much more to the claims than settlement money. There's much more at stake in looking into pre-confederation and post-confederation treaties than just money. Okay. There is the right to self-determination. There is the right to a positive indigenous identity. There is a right to cultural and religious beliefs, the exercisement of those cultural beliefs, those ceremonies, the languages, the right to be a First Nations person, the right to be, you know, the freedom to be a Michisaw Anishinaabe person is embedded in these treaties when we negotiate them, okay? Because when we entered into these agreements, entered into these negotiations, we came at it with, you know, what I want to call a, you know, a Minob Modsman way of thinking, right? And that good life, that good way of living um, frame of mind. And that considering those next generations, you know, because our life is an investment in the next generation. So when they negotiated these treaties, they certainly talked about subsistence rights back in 1818 and said, no, for the survival and the flourishment of our communities, no, we still want to be able to go out there and harvest, gather for subsistence, for income, and for the benefit of our communities, our families, and our nations. Okay. And so the terms of the negotiated settlement, which there wasn't a settlement until 2018, okay? So 1992, all the way to 2018, that's 26 years. I'm, uh, I'm 27 now. So I was born in 1993. So when I talk about those individuals making an investment in the next generation, I'm talking specifically about myself. Um, had my community not been involved, had Alderville not taken it upon themselves to put forth a claim to the Canadian court system, I might not be able to really understand who I am as a Michisaugi person, the rights and freedoms that I have within my territory, and the relationship that exists between myself and non-Indigenous individuals in Peterborough City and County. Okay, so it's very, it's, it's a lot more than just money, okay? It really described my place in this whole thing as well as, uh, you know, your friends that are members at Hiawatha Curve Lake, Alderville, Scugog, Rama, Beausoleil, Georgina Island First Nations, right? Okay. And so some of the negotiated pieces of this settlement were, again, financial compensation of $1.11 billion, $666 million by Canada and $444 million by Ontario, because they did acknowledge that there was not proper compensation, nor were these, nor was the compensation negotiated in good faith. Okay. So if we go back, right? So over 50,000 kilometers squared was seated in this treaty, and $233,000, $223,425,000 went to the Mississauga signatory bands, and $233,375 went to the Chippewa signatory bands. And lastly, a one time payment of $25 was made out to each band member. <clears throat> and so when I talk about this, this you know, inappropriate 
and lackluster compensation package that was signed signed and negotiated in 1923. I want to take a look how big this territory is. And let's go back to 1923 in our minds, okay? So we're looking at the Roaring Twenties. It's after World War One. The world is a totally different place, okay? There is industry. We are certainly through Industrial Revolution. We're sort of modernizing at this time, okay? So you can't tell me that this large square of Ontario had nothing going on in it. No industry, no logging, no mining, right? And so to compensate these bands, With, with just over $230,000, it doesn't make any sense, right? Um, they got a heck of a deal. That's how I always word it. Uh, uh, the province of Ontario and, and the government of Canada got a very handsome deal on this real estate. So for anybody whose family is in real estate, you know, land is a premium, land is a price, and land is not cheap. Mm -hmm. Again, so an entitlement for each First Nation to add up to 11,000 acres of land to their reserve land base, subject to Canada's additions to reserve slash reserve creation policy. So there is a legislated policy that deals specifically to what we call ATR lands or addition to reserve lands. Okay, and the First Nations are responsible for acquiring these lands. And what that simply means is that I'll use Hiawatha First Nation for an example. Using this financial compensation package and the ability to add up to 11,000 acres of land to their reserve, Hiawatha the First Nation could go on what we call a buying spree and purchase lands held by private landowners, negotiate lands that are considered crown lands, as well as pursue lands that are under environmental protection and procure those lands and then put them through the additions to reserve process through the government of Canada to flip that land back over to First Nations territory, okay? And First Nations territory is land that is legislated by the federal government, not by the provincial government, okay? And that's sort of a, a very in-depth conversation that we can have maybe at the end of this or maybe in a different session and specifically talking about, you know, who holds the relationship and where do First Nations people sit sort of in, in the scheme of things. You know, you have the federal government, the provincial government, and then you have municipal governments. And where do First Nations people sit in that? Well, if we go back to our definition of treaty, right, an agreement between two sovereigns or two nations, when those treaties are signed, they're between the British Crown or the government of Canada acting on behalf of the Crown and First Nations people. So would it not be safe to assume that where First Nations people sit in the relationship is akin to or at the same level as the federal government, or even the British crown. Okay. And so that's why we look at, you know, these additions to reserve and, and, and why it's, why it's such a process and why the, and why, you know, first nations are starkly different and operate starkly differently than say the city of Peterborough or Otonabee South Monaghan township or Northumberland County or the city of Port or the, sorry, the city of Port Hope and the city of Coburg, why they operate so differently and why they look so different than First Nations communities or reserves as, as they're often referred to, okay? As well, a negotiated part of the seminar was a recognition of the First Nations continuing treaty harvesting rights and a commitment to continue to work together to implement these rights. And I wanna add that these rights, so we're, call, so we're calling them treaty harvesting rights. I wanna call them inherent harvesting and gathering rights upheld by treaty or signified by treaty and then entrenched in section 35 of the Canadian Constitution Act, okay? And then also down at the bottom, which was a really important piece for us, is a commitment by Canada and Ontario to provide an oral and written statement of apology to the Williams Treaty's First Nations. And that was delivered and provided in November, 2018, okay? And so here are some of my sources, right? We've got, uh, all right. So, questions. So I, I hope that that provided a lot of information. I know it is it's it's a tidal wave of information, especially for you know a lot of people who are new to these discussions, or new to talking about the William Trees, or new to just sort of talking about the Indigenous relationship in Canada and North America. I know you know. It can be very confusing, um, but please, if there are some questions, um, submit them.
you know, I'm totally open to answering some of those questions. Okay. So while while people are thinking about um, their questions, Ryan, I would just like to say Chimiguach again. That was a master's class <laughs> in, in treaty history and especially bringing it up to the contemporary. Um, as a little added note, on November 26, we will have uh, two uh, youth from Curve Lake First Nation with two members of the uh, CEDI team that were part of the 200th anniversary of the Treaty 20 signing. And there was a friendship accord that was negotiated between the, the municipalities and Hiawatha First Nation and Curve Lake First Nation. Um, but we were part of a move to include the youth this time. And so this is this is not an, it's certainly, um, not going to be without added work, but we want to reinforce um, the relevancy of these treaties for everyone. So not just Indigenous youth, but non-Indigenous youth as well. So that will be on the 26th. If you're free, you're more than welcome to, to, to join in. So we have some questions coming up for you. Um, yeah, well, I, um, I did want to, I first wanted to sort of um, you know, give a shout out and acknowledge, you know, our, our, I want to call our brother and sister communities out on the East coast. So I know we're talking about Michisaugi treaties right here. And I know you mentioned it's sort of a master's level introduction to treaties, but really it's a master's level introduction to just four treaties, right? Out of, you know, the multitude of treaties specifically just in Ontario. So you see it, it's a scratch on the surface. It's a, you know, the tip of the iceberg, as they call it, right? And so I want to acknowledge out on the East Coast, you know, our, our big Mogi brothers and sisters who are fighting to uphold, recognize, you know, those rights, those inherent rights to hunt, gather, harvest for subsistence and what they call moderate livelihood. And I want to acknowledge that it's not up to those Mi'kma'ki communities, those Mi'kma'ki nations to determine moderate livelihood. It's actually, you know, the federal government of Canada and the province, uh, you know, those maritime provinces to negotiate with those First Nations bands into what does moderate livelihood mean to you? What does it mean to us? And let's meet in the middle. Um, you know, it's very sad that they did not negotiate this over the past 20 years, you know, after uh, we know Donald Marshall took his fight to the Supreme Court. So it's not for a lack of openness and a lack of trying for First Nations people or Mi'kmaq people. It's a lack of willingness to enter into those negotiations and those partnerships on the side of the crown. And so I look to them as uh, role models, as warriors and as leaders for myself, for youth and for, you know, those people that are going up in those knowledge holder and elder positions to look at them and say, you're doing good work. We're behind you. We support you um, because this really aids in the larger discussion around Indigenous sovereignty and nationhood here in North America. So, you know, uh, miigwech to Dean just for being, for existing as a, as a Mi'kmaq individual, you know, um, because we know we're, uh, we're what our ancestors envisioned and dreamed and planned for, okay? We're the manifestation of 500 years of fighting and struggle. And so if we're not learning, if we're not contributing and we're not building, um, then we should certainly align ourselves to do that. And so I encourage you as youth, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, best you can do is put tools in your tool belt and be educated. It's, it's the best you can do. Well, Alan, for that shout out, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to uh, answer Nico's question. We are recording these, Nico, because they're going to be going up uh, on our YouTube channel um, that will be launched at the end of the month so that students and teachers and, and people that are just interested in learning will have a chance to do it. But I, I, I want to speak to that process as well, Nico, because it's important because Ryan was speaking about informed consent, and that goes beyond just when we're talking about treaties. So the informed consent with our recordings, um, all of our presenters were asked in advance if they were comfortable having their session recorded. So I've only recording those um, with those people that have said yes in advance, but also informed consent means they have to see the finished product of the video and approve it before it gets uploaded. Um, and that's another level that sometimes gets passed over and, Western negotiations and seeking consent. And this is very much a part of, of showing 
that reciprocated respect with within with indigenous peoples. So thank you. That that was a good question. Um, so I know you're probably checking the, out the chat room as well, mm -hmm. Ryan. Um, let's go with Ben's. Uh, so Ben Newell is asking, when did you start going to school meets or anything else uh, and talking about this? Uh, um, geez, you know, I, I want to say it started probably back in around the same grades you guys are. Um, you know, my mom sat in my corner and she was very much an ad advocate on educating yourself about what we call Aboriginal issues in Canada. But it really starts at looking at similar themes around the world. And so I, you know, as a young person, uh, I found myself really interested and and fascinated by Nelson Mandela and his, you know, lifetime commitment, struggle and fight for equality and justice in South Africa. And so from there it ballooned. And so I grew up understanding the Ipperwash crisis or, you know, the, the murder of Dudley George and then starting, you know, growing up in a community where hunting and gathering is a priority. So you're kind of always learning and talking about it. And so when I referenced that George Howard Sr., um, he operated a, a hunting camp uh, in Hiawatha First Nation. So as a youth, I got to spend a lot of time around there, around this individual. And I really didn't know later in life that this individual was a leader and a warrior. I just looked at him as uh, an old head that wore camo all the time that you know liked to go hunting and hang out. Yeah, I didn't see this person as a change maker, or a shaker and a mover. So I guess it really started, yeah, in, in that sort of uh, junior level and then leading into that intermediate senior where in high school I really started to incorporate these types of pieces into my history projects, into my geography projects, into my uh, social and civic studies projects. And then when I went away to university in Ottawa at Carleton, um, most times uh, I took a criminology and criminal justice degree. So most of what I talked about was law, psychology, and sociology. And right there, I can look at everything through an indigenous lens. And that's what I incorporated into doing those projects was looking at these projects through an indigenous lens. How can I share that perspective and how can I bring evidence to the forefront to support that and hopefully educate individuals around me with these projects. And then I get into my professional realm where I started to work with, uh, the Nogodronong Friendship Center, where I started to do professional development sessions with KPR staff, uh, Northumberland County uh, Social Services and Education staff, Peter Brown County staff. Um, you know, I guess, it, yeah, I guess it's kind of been a, geez, I want to say probably a 15 year journey to get to this point. And now I feel really comfortable bringing it all to the forefront. Um, so probably within the past two years, it's really taken off. Yes. Miigwech, Ryan. Um, I think we probably have one more question that we can take just time-wise before we lose people to their lunch. Um, th this is pretty amazing, again, you know, that we have um, students sitting at home as part of their virtual school doing this. So uh, I'm enjoying the, <laughs> I'm enjoying knowing that some students are more comfortable sitting at home than sitting into a, a hard plastic seat <laughs> back in school. Uh, so our next question, our last one, is from Alicia Del Maestro. Um, hello, we are a grade four or five class tuning in from Buckhorn. We are wondering if it was First Nations lawyers that represented the Williams Treaty's First Nations groups. Okay. In, indirectly, yes. Directly, no. So it was the, the Hutchins legal team or, or Hutchins law firm out of Toronto, Ontario, that represented the Williams Treaty's First Nations in the Aldeville litigation. But what's really interesting is the Supreme Court judge that was residing over it was actually a First Nations individual from Manitoulin Island and a member at Wakwamakong First Nation. It was uh, Justice Mon Mondeman or Mandeman, uh, Joseph Mondeman. Um, and jo Justice Mondeman was on the verge of retirement in 2012. They had expressed that I'm looking to retire within this particular window. I don't want to hand this claim off, this particular challenge off. I want to resolve this issue. I want to reach a negotiated settlement for this in my time as a Supreme Court justice. Okay. And so that's why there was kind of a push between 2012 to 2018 to get it done because it could have certainly 
dragged on longer and longer and longer had Joseph Mondeman or Justice Mondeman not expressed that I want to retire, but I want to reside over this and I want to finish this and that I will not be handing this off to anybody else. So when I say uh, it was not lawyers, it was certainly really a judge who saw that the justice and equality within this particular claim needed to be addressed, it needed to be achieved, and there needed to be a proper uh, you know, a proper and willing informed decision and negotiation and settlement with this. And he wanted to preside over it. So that was really powerful. And that really spoke to a lot of people in the room when we would have large community and, and nation to nation gatherings discussing whereabouts this challenge is at, where is this case at? And it was always brought that Justice Mondeman wants to resolve this, wants to reach a fair negotiated settlement and doesn't want to hand this off. So I guess that's something really interesting. It wasn't the lawyers, it was actually the judge. But the Hutchins legal team was amazing. They were really great community-minded people that when they came and visited, um, they really didn't appear as a lawyer to you. They weren't as intimidating as a lawyer potentially is. They were very laid back individuals. They were human beings just like us that saw that, um, you know, this is a, a moral ethics and justice issue. So yeah, it was very interesting. So Chimigwech, Ryan, Wallen, for, for all of your good words, your, your important message. And like I said, the depth of your talk. Um, if that has taken 15 years to get to that point, I can't wait to hear where you are 15 years from now uh, in doing these talks. Um, on behalf of KPR and all the students and the teachers that have joined, I'd also like to say uh, Chimigwech and thank you. Um, and thank you to all of you that have been listening um that have been following respectfully and i'm looking forward to seeing you coming back for some of our other sessions coming up for the month and later on so everyone take care stay safe treat each other kindly and we'll see you soon yeah how miigwech everybody for coming and, and miigwech for listening to my words uh and uh, i hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day enjoy the rest of your weekend and uh yeah, remember that uh, knowledge is tools on your tool belt, and and they can make it. They can make a difference, whether small or large. Okay, so yeah, we glad. So Dean, is that that's the end of this session, eh? So I can jump out now.